Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, with, and with them others besides the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Now when we last left Jehoshaphat in chapter 19, guess what? He was getting right. He was doing what God wanted to do, and guess what? Here comes the enemy, the devil. And when you when you take a stand to do right, there's a devil always. That's that's a guarantee. That's a, that's a promise. Because Paul wrote, "All they that will live godly shall suffer persecution." And the thing is, if you ain't got persecution in your life, you're not doing something right. Because that's the formula for today. So uh, Moab, that is the children of Lot. Amen were the children of Lot. And it's amazing how you go through these these stories here, and they're all family. Lot was Abraham's brother's son, I think, or something like that. Nephew. Whatever, whatever, a nephew, nephew relationship there. They're all kin. They're, uh, Ham and I, okay. And there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazar Tamar. Which is in Gedi. Well, evidently, uh, Jehoshaphat didn't know that this was going on. They brought him word to tell him that there's battle. He needs to do something. And Jehoshaphat feared. I mean, here's a guy doing right, and he feared. I mean, as much as we're not to fear, we're to trust God. Fear is one of those just basic first emotions that come up it's what you do with your fear after when you realize okay this is the situation I mean if you're if you're laying in bed at 2 o'clock in the morning you start smelling smoke and you look outside your door and you see orange and red you're going to panic then okay what do I need to do sit there and Panic or okay, need to get people out of the house, need to call nine one one, need to take care of things. And set himself to seek the Lord. So he feared, then he went to the Lord proper. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So here's where fasting fasting is where you go without food. Uh I'm some people do all water, some people do milk. There are some people who fast and they'll eat certain kinds of food. I mean, the fast is pretty much between you and the Lord. If you have a medical condition like a, a diabetes, or if you need food for whatever your condition is, I would not proclaim a major fast. Now, based upon a medical condition, I mean, if you can only fast three hours without doing yourself harm, fast for three hours. If you can fast for 24 hours, do it. It's based upon what your what your body's ability, what your ability. I mean, I don't think God will hold you wrong if you fasted for three hours and that's all you can do. Or if you start fasting and you start having a medical dilemma in your life and you need something, well, I don't think God's going to pass judgment against you because your body is reacting. And he proclaimed the fast through all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together. Unity. To ask help of the Lord. Seeking God together. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now Judah is the main focus of Chronicles. This is the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the line where you're going to find good kings. You're going to find some bad kings. Israel, you don't find any good kings. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. So as king, he goes up to the temple and he's standing at the temple before all the people, making a proclamation. And said, O Lord our God, O Lord God of our fathers. So he breaks out in prayer. As a king, as a leader of the nation, he's standing before the temple. And he's praying. And God is recording the prayer. 
it's amazing that God will record our prayers. Now, these prayers are not to be recorded to, to rehearse them word for word. They're in here to tell you, hey, listen, there are people who pray. They're like Jehoshaphat. He's scared. Here comes an army, and this is the prayer. This is what you're to do. You get scared, seek the Lord, fast, and pray. And notice how he goes right to God, God of heaven, not the God of evolution. And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there no, not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. In other words, no one is going to beat God. God is the winner and ultimate winner of all. Art not thou our God? Now, there's times you see in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they'll come and say, well, pray to, pray to your God for me. Well, Jehoshaphat says, our God. It's his God. He's not afraid to proclaim his God. Who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel? He's going back to history. He's going back through the book of Numbers. He's going back through Joshua. When they entered the promised land. And gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever. He reminds God of the covenant. There's nothing wrong with it. It would say, God, thus saves your word. If when you say, thus saves your word, it properly applies to you and the age that you're in. You've got to, you to get that correct with scriptures. But there's nothing wrong with saying, God, you know, and whatever scripture comes to mind that you that you quote to God. Matter of fact, I think God is pleased when you quote his scripture back to him. That shows you're studying, that shows you're in the word, that shows you really have a heart. And they dwelt therein in Israel, and they had built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, This is the temple. If when evil come upon us, as sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. Now he's quoting Solomon. Chapter 6, verse 12, I have written down. So, when we read chapter 6, verse 12, when we read Solomon's praying, Somebody was writing down, and King Jehoshaphat has access to that. He has, at least to our knowledge, he has at least Second Chronicles chapter 6 that he's read, and he's quoting to God. He's saying, God, remember this thing that Solomon said? And now behold the children of Ammon, of Lot, of Moab, of Lot, and Mount Seir, uh, that's the Edomites. That's the brother of Jacob, another kinship, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade. In other words, when they went into the promised land, when they passed these lands, God says, don't you touch their lands. That land belongs to Ammon, that land belongs to Moab, and that land belongs to Esau. Leave them alone. This is not your land. But they turned them. They, but, yeah, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. They obeyed God. But I say, how they rewarded us to come to cast out thy possession which thou hast given us in here. And he's saying, hey, listen, we didn't touch you guys. We didn't bother you guys. We went through your land, and this is how you reward us. You're coming to attack us. Good job. Thank you very much. He's also saying is that this attack by Edom, this attack by Moab, and this attack by Ammon, is, there's no cause for it. They are lacking a reason. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. We're not going to win. Not by human strength. Neither know we what to do. We have no idea what to do. We're dumbfounded. But our eyes are upon thee. That's the only thing you can do. Uh, 
I'm trying to think. Is there a hymn song like "Put Your Eyes Upon Jesus"? Something like that. Cast your eyes. I forget. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. They gathered a whole family together in prayer over uh, Jehoshaphat praying. It's a family thing. And upon Jaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mananiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Here comes the Holy Spirit. Now they didn't dwell. The Holy Spirit did not dwell in the Old Testament saints like He dwells in us. The Holy Spirit would come and go. Look at the life of King Saul. And he said, through the Holy Spirit inspiration, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. It's kind of weird that he puts it, the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they puts the king last for whatever reason. Maybe the people had even more heart in jo than what Jehoshaphat had. And that's the case, man. You have a unity of believers. You have a unity under the king to do right, if that's the case. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And you just imagine there's people that's hearing that. Now, now, now comes faith. I mean, what's God going to do tomorrow? <laughs> what about now, Lord? <laughs> Here they come. Tomorrow, go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Zid. Zid. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jerio. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. You're not going to, to draw a sword. You're not going to sling a stone. You're not going to have a sword play. You will not fight at all. Now, you can just imagine Israel like, well, how are we going to win? Now, this would be a good idea to, to, to remember the history of Israel. To go through, let's see, the walls of Jericho just fell down flat. Uh, um, I want to say Solomon. It's not Solomon. Uh, Samson with the jawbone of an ass. God hurled great uh, hailstones, and and this is where it'd be a good idea to know what God has already done for you in your life. So when you come up to these particular battles, say, "Listen, God got me through this before. He's not going to use the same way, but He always gets the victory. He always takes care of me." So set yourselves, stand ye still. That's completely opposite what God told him to do at the Red Sea. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, something like that. And God's like, uh, no, uh, excuse me, get going. Uh, excuse me, Lord, there's a big body of water here. Well, just lift up your rod and watch what will happen. So, God told Israel at the Red Sea to go forward. Now he's telling them a whole different thing. And you got to realize in your Christian walk, say, well, wait a minute. This is how God did it before, but yet God will God does not uh, He doesn't have a cookie cutter religion. You don't take a cookie and make a whole bunch of gingerbread men. God likes doing things afresh. He likes doing things new. He likes you to tell the testimony of what He's done for you. And see the salvation of the Lord with you. Well, so wait a minute. We're going to see the salvation. We're not going to do nothing. We're going to stand here. We're not going to fight. But it's going to be salvation. Okay. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. He's like, wait a minute. You didn't tell us. You just told us not to fight them. But you tell us to go out against them. So he's telling them, say, listen, prepare to go to fight, but you're not going to fight, but go like you're going to. So, for the Lord will be with you. And that's where they get the expression, where the force may be with you. 
got out of King James Bible. They changed the Lord to a force. Well, I'm sorry, the Lord is not a force because he was a human being. He's a spirit. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. Now, evidently, he's probably on his knees. And his forehead and his face is touching the dirt where he was made from, where God made man. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord in worshiping him. Now that doesn't mean they fell in battle. It means they got down their knees, they got down on the ground. In other words, they hit the dirt. And red wings and God. And the Levites, of the children of the Kohites, and of the children of the Kohites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Now, there are religions out there will try to imitate this voice, this loud voice. It's just praising God. You're not doing it for a flesh, and you're not doing it for a show. You're just doing it because your voice. Listen, some people have a, have a high voice that God's given them, especially those he's called into the ministry. And people like me, they'll say, you know, listen, you're yelling at me. No, I'm not yelling at you. This is the voice that God's given me. You want to hear me yell, I can yell. I don't have a quiet spirit or quiet voice. So when I talk, I talk on high. When I preach, I get loud. And they rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekia. And they, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophet, so shall ye prosper. You see how much important faith is? Faith is believing. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. They're hoping for victory. The evidence of things not seen. They haven't seen nothing yet. And, but, oh, God's already working in the, in the background. They're going off the battle into a battle that God says you're not going to fight. You can just imagine everyone just sitting there scratching their head like, I wonder if they have their weaponry with them. Because he already told them, he said, listen, you're not going to fight this battle. You imagine with Gideon? Okay, Gideon, where's our weaponry? Where's our guns? Where's our sling? You ain't got no guns. You ain't got no sling. Well, what do we have? Uh, I believe it was a ram's horn, a pitcher, and a candle. Yeah. Right. Okay. You've already slacked our entire force down to, to 300 men. And you, and you wonder, is Israel, Mar Judah marching? I keep saying Israel. Is Judah marching, trusting God, not even having their weaponry? Because like I said, God already told them, you're not going to need to fight. Here, I uh, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you establish. Believe his prophets. And... And so shall ye prosper. And when he had counseled the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. In the midst of a battle, he's got singers. I never want to be in a battle. I never have been in a battle. I don't want to be in a battle. And then the sink there, I'm just going to be sitting there singing. But then again, God's with him. And they should praise the beauty of his holiness, the beauty of holiness. As they went about, yeah, I know that. As they went out before the enemy, now they're in their front lines. And to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and pray and to praise and to praise, the Lord set an ambushment against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. And, or excuse me, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. When they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. Now, did you get that verse? Here's the story. Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which is Edom, are coming against Judah to fight them. 
God has Moab and Ammon. They killed the inhabitants of Mount Seir, Edom. When they're done killing the Edomites, guess what? Moab and Ammon going at each other, killing each other. I would think the word you would probably say would be a Polish kamikaze. They're killing their own people. I mean, you want to talk about a war, you want to talk about a battle, here's a bunch of guys killing them own selves. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies falling to the earth, and none escaped. Now, do you ever think about how weird that was? None escaped. There had to have been someone standing because you had to have somebody kill the last person. If you get that right and you really read the Bible and how God is, the last two people killed the last two people standing. Because the Bible says, and the Bible is true, none escaped. So Eden was killed by Moab and Ammon, and Moab and Ammon were killed by Moab and Ammon, their own people. And Israel walks into the battle and is like, oh, they're dead. And when Jehoshaphat his, and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they did strip off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Imagine three days of three groups of people going, you know, taking jewelry, taking money, taking gold, and everything. Now, you guys are not going to mark your Bibles as much as I mark mine, but you need to mark three days. You need to mark three, somehow. You need to pay attention to how much that three shows up, and especially three days. Now, when they turn around and tell you that uh, three days and three nights, as Jesus spoke about, him being the heart of your earth, and they'll tell you because I read it. That's that's irrelevant. They're, they're figure of speeching. Jesus didn't mean three actual literal days, and he didn't mean three actual literal nights. That's where they get off saying that. And I looked it up. I saw that's how they get away with Good Friday. It was an expression. Yeah, but when you read the Bible and you see so many three days and three nights, come on. It's, I don't know how you get it, because that's, that's something important. Three days and third and three is very important. On the fourth day, by the way, three is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. On the fourth day, they assembled themselves in a valley of Barak, for they, they blessed the Lord. Now look at that. Bless means made happy. They're out there going they're out there three days gathering gold, silver, and all that, and they return with all that stuff and they make God happy. God wrote this great victory and, and they were just pleased and just put so much faith in them and listened to the the prophets and they were astonished. And they trusted the Lord in return. God was pleased. Now you got to admit that this story before it happens, like, oh boy, Lord, we're going to go into battle, but we're not going to fight, but we're going to win. Okay. Therefore, the name of this, therefore, the name of the same place was called the Valley of Baraka, unto this day. And that means blessing. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them. I mean, the king's out there, yay! He's the first one, he's, he's, he's happy as a clam. He's praising the Lord, he's the king. He's not hiding. In the forefront of them, to go again to Jerusalem with joy. Your Christian life is to be joy. 
For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And well, rejoice over their enemies. They come walking in, enemies are dead, and hey, thank you very much. I was looking for something like that, or I needed that, that Moabite coin to fill my collection. Thank you. And they came to Jerusalem with, with uh, salt trees and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. Now look at that. They go right from the battlefield. They go right through, marching through Jerusalem. They march right up to the temple, and they pick up the instruments, and they start praising God again. Now they had already made God happy in the valley in the valley of Baruch, in the valley of Baruch, it says that the Lord was blessed. Imagine what it is when they're on the highest point in Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah, on the temple, with all these instruments, praising God. And God looks down, and how many years he looks back, and there was the story of Abraham and Isaac at that very spot. When God looked down, he says, that. That's the same spot where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. That's going to be the same spot where I'm going to offer my son. And they're sitting down there. They're playing music to me. Now, you want to picture the scene of Job chapter 2? With the devil up there right now? And God's like, do you see what my people's doing? Can I say something else now? You do know that the devil's going to go back and he's going to mess with the party. For every up in your life, there's a down. Just, just get that down. When you're up on the mountaintop, you're not going to stay there long. Just get there. Just plan for every life to be valleys. But the valleys is where you learn things. The valleys is where God walks with you. You know, on the mountaintop, you can leave God. So they're, up, they're on the Mount Moriah. They're in the temple. And the fear of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. No one's there going to go against Israel. They're in a panic. I mean, seeing that in the newspapers. Did you hear what happened? These guys went out to fight Israel and they killed them themselves. Their God got to that. Okay. Don't want to mess with that God. That's the same God that did. I mean, the story's still going around. That's the same God that destroyed Egypt. That's the same God that destroyed uh, Jericho. And how many years down the road is going to be the same God that destroys his temple because of sin? So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, peaceful. No one came in and attacked him like the Moabites and all that did. For his God gave him rest round about. He met his God. Can you imagine God coming? You're my God. No, wait a minute. No, I said that wrong. Imagine God going up to you and saying, I'm his God. I'm her God. Imagine God going to Satan. What about him? I'm his God. I'm her God. As he said, Job, that's my servant. When God, can, when God can go up to you and say, I'm his God, I'm her God, you're in a particular, I mean, I, I guarantee, without a shadow of a doubt, God can say about Paul, I'm his God. Listen, even the devils in hell said, listen, Paul I know, and Jesus I know. When Paul woke up in the morning, he scared all the devils in hell because, what's that guy going to do now? You don't believe me? Look how many times they tried to kill that young man. I mean, short man. I didn't mean young. Short. He was, he was a Jew. They stole him outside of uh, 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 one of the cities there. And they're all looking down. And he comes back alive. And I bet you all the devil's like, whoa. What happened there? His God. I hope, I, I hope God can say about me on... That God can say, I'm his God. I hope. I don't know. I'm too much of a sinner. I just, I tried my best and I failed. I don't know. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign. 
They reign 20 in 5 years, so that would be uh, 60 years. Oh, wait a minute, no, that's not 60 years. He'd be 60 years old. That's what it is. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shahira. Now, why does it list the mothers? I have no idea. But you already know who the fathers are because he's the one that succeeded in the throne. Now, some mothers we're going to see as we read in our family today. You need to know the mother because guess what? One of the mothers that we read today was the daughter of Jezebel. And you say, well, how much wickedness could... Why did that happen? Well, because the daughter was Jezebel's... I mean, the, the, the mother was Jezebel's daughter. Well, duh. <laughs> so, there's an importance of naming the mother's name for some and for others. It's there for a reason. And if you really study it out, you probably figure out what it is. But for some, for most, there's a clue. And he walked in the ways of Asa his father and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Oh, amen. How be it? The high places were not taken away. For as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto, unto God of the fathers, of their fathers. So he's got the nation right, but there's some people still in the high places worshiping gods. And he's not going to force himself on them. If that's what you want to believe, that's what you're going to believe. That's not the right God. And you don't force anybody into religion. Now the rest of the acts of Je Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Je Jehu, the son of Hanai, which we don't have, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. And that's the kings, first and second kings. After this did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Azahiah, the king of Israel, who did very weakly, wickedly. He goes right back and does the same sin that he did before. Why he keeps running to Israel, why he keeps running to, to this wickedness, I don't know. Is he trying to help them out? Is he what it is? We're not told, but he goes right back to the king of Israel. And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezon Gaber. He, he builds up this, this unity navy. Then Eliezer, the son of Dadviah of Marsharath, prophesied against Jehoshaphat. Saying, because thou hast joined thyself with Azahiah, the Lord has broken thy works. So hanging out with the wrong people, God's going to break your works. And the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. And that's the last part of we read of Jehoshaphat. He did good, he did bad, he did good, he did bad, he did good, he did bad. That's, that's the story of everybody's life. 